if we have pictures, if we have, uh, sorry. Okay, if we have pictures, if we have um, text, and if we have audio, can we somehow combine them to do something better to improve um, yeah, this type of models in order to get a higher quality or solve something new? And if, if I suggest, oh, maybe we should not consider uh, only one modality, but several, then of course you should at the beginning ask the questions why why should we do that and we'll see there are different motivations for that but one we can definitely also look is is how we hum we humans perceive the, the world and uh, if you look at how wh what type of modalities humans can understand we are always in a more multimodal uh type of perception it's never that we are or not never of course but mostly we're not only listening we are listening we are watching we are reading stuff we are maybe touching so there's different types of sensor input we are getting and we are trying to combine them in order to yeah get uh, get all the information we are needing and we know from from science there that it's really important to also have this type of multimodal input um if one modality is missing often learning is, is a lot more challenging and we can it can help us because these channels are complementary to each other so each of these channels can help the other a bit on like dealing with problems when when there's uh, less information in one of the channels and similarly there is also uh, an increasing amount of research on building on solving tasks by not only looking at a single mo a modality, but by looking at several modalities. Again, of course, it's sometimes more challenging for setting up. You have to deal with two different types of input. You have to understand them. You have to get them. If you think about, yeah, I mean, we're still we'll, we'll doing some training and, and want to train a model. So you need to um, yeah, align this type of information. Um, so often, of course, it's easier to build a model which only deals with one modality. However, we can get better and therefore we'll today look into what do we need to do in order to take advantage of these uh, different modalities and uh, thereby then somehow improve the performance. So first of all, maybe that now sounds a bit abstract. Um, so therefore it might be good to look at some examples where multimodal information might be very helpful. And one of the, the first things people have there looked into is what is referred to as audiovisual speech recognition. So the idea is that you you had this this last week that you do um, audio speech recognition. So you get the speech signal here on the top, and then you have your speech recognizer and you transcribe it and you have the text there. In audiovisual, you also have a video, hopefully some of the speaker, and that can help you to hopefully improve. The, the the quality of the transcription. Any idea when when this could be, for example, uh, especially very important? Yes. Yes. So that's exactly the idea. If the audio quality isn't good can be different reasons. This can be that speakers are speaking at the same time. It can be large background noise um, and so on. So in this case, especially the, the video can be helpful. And as you mentioned, what you're mainly doing then somehow is add some type of lip reading. So it's, uh, I guess, as a human, we're doing similar things. So if it's getting very loud and so on, we try to look at the speaker to guess um, uh, what he's saying. And so in this case, it's also the, the idea that we can get more robust uh, when we have two modalities. And if one modality gets uh, disturbed and there is, is less information, then we can also use the other modality. Of course, in general, like for humans, it's a lot more difficult to do speech recognition uh, just based on the video. That's typically also not done. I mean, there's some work on lip reading, but of course that is, is more challenging. But by having these two types of information and joining them, we hopefully can get better and especially more robust. 
Um, a similar task is what is referred to as uh, multimodal emotion recognition. So there is the idea we want to recognize uh, the emotion of uh, some person in a short video or short clip or short time segment. And um, so it can be different types of emotion, angry, sad, happy. Typically, it's like a fixed class uh, classification problem. So you have something like six or, or 10 different emotion classes, and then you should assign the this uh, the speaker to this type of emotion. And there again, of course, you can do that purely based on the audio. You can do that purely based on the video, but it might be easier and better if you have two modalities and then you get typically a better performance and where you can use both the audio, so what he's saying and um, yeah, the, 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 the picture of it. Sometimes even the text is an additional modality and even more help, also hopefully helpful. So then it's like of the speech signal. On the one hand, the content is, is helpful. Uh, on the other hand, of course, also other characteristics like his uh, prosody and so on can also be helpful in order to better estimate um, what this is. So um, yeah, these two examples are two examples where it is about um, improving the quality, the robustness, and so on of the system by not relying only on uh, on one data set. And at least uh, the information at least are partly redundant. So we can do part of the task at least also with only uh, one of these modalities. There are, of course, also other interesting cases where you really need to rely on both modalities and the task doesn't make any sense without knowing both modalities. Uh, one yeah, famous example for this is, is what is referred to as uh, visual question answering. So general question answering is a task of you give it the system a question and it should answer the, this question. It's a very common task in, in natural language processing. However, there is, of course, all, often also interesting use cases where you should answer the question not based only on the text, but also based on other modalities. For example, here is like the, this task of uh, what, what color is, is the car? And this question, of course, doesn't make se any sense without having a picture of a car. On the other hand, the picture of the car, uh, we can't easily do some question answering without knowing the question. So in this case, we really have two complementary uh, information, we need to somehow combine them and then to generate our answer that the color of this uh, car is blue. And then you can, of course, have more, yeah, more powerful AI tools if they are not only can interpret the text which was given to them, but also additional context like, um, like images. And you've maybe seen that with one of the recent um, big hyped events in, in AI, the presentation of GPT-4, uh, where one claimed that one of the big advantages of these systems are their ability to not only perform dialogues, as we've seen before, but also to perform multimodal dialogues. So the system is able to get both types of input, uh, a picture and text, and then it can answer or, or like start the dialogue. So here's the example. What is funny about this image? Describe it uh, panel by panel. And you have here this, this is from the official GPT-4 paper. You have here this, um, this picture, then it really describes what, what is the difference. And the final thing is, is here put, in, put on the left. I hope you can read it. The humor in this image comes from the absurdity of plugging a large outdated VGA connector into a small modern smartphone charging port. So in order to answer this question, it's again, or like to do this dialogue, it's again important to understand both. On the one hand, the question, and on the other hand, um, the um, uh, the image, and then combine both of these information in some way so that that the system is then able to answer questions about it um, and so on. So um, what we today want to look into is like, given these type of use cases, how can we build systems which um, can do that and which can 
uh, build this type of models. And before we are looking into yeah, this type of solutions for, of course, the first example, if the first question is, of course, what is a modality? How do modalities differ? And why is this all um, yeah, so challenging? Um, generally, a modality is a way in which something is expressed or perceived, and we are having different modalities. There's a different types of modalities, and they have different abstraction levels. So we can have more the raw modalities, which are very near to the to the sensor, can, for example, be speech or an image. And then we can higher and higher abstraction of that language. We can have directly the sentiment, can have object or object categories, and we can have like different types of components which give us already this type of abstraction. And then we might to somehow combine um, these type of, of uh, modalities. And of course, there is a lot more different types of sensor data than just speech and vision. So we have, of course, the, uh, the, the most common modalities and that will be the focus of um, today's lecture. And th that is text, audio and vision. Uh, where we somehow combine text data with combining then like what people are speaking, also different types of audio signals and uh, pictures or videos. But uh, if you think of different AI agents, they might have uh, many more other types of, of information. It can be like touch signals, which can also be helpful in order to understand and observe the, the world that like, if you think of a robot that can touch and, and thereby get additional information. Or if you think more about like um, newest health technology things, um, you can inf have information about the user, like its heart rate. And uh, there's a lot of research about like brain signal uh, processing. So there is a, a wide variety of different types of um, modalities that, that can be used and that can be combined to do then um, a good and, and, and better processing of the input and better understand what is happening in the world. And the biggest challenge when we think about it and when we yeah, try to handle them is that these types of modalities are, are, can be very, very different. So it's not that they all have a very similar type of structure, but in different dimensions, the information encoded in the different signals can be very different, which of course makes the time of like the way of how we process it difficult and we cannot like directly like combine them. What do I mean with uh, like th that they're heterogene? So on the one hand, of course, we have the difference between raw modalities and abstract modalities. So if we have something close to the sensor, like an audio signal, you learned last week, if you think about an audio signal, um, there's a lot more noise in it. We have a lot high, higher frequency, uh, more information, like more data to process. Then if you think of a more abstract one, which is language. So if you look at the, like the size of, or the length of a signal for like a, a sentence that is spoken, then if you put it into a speech recognition system, these type of features are like extremely longer than you would just encode some of the text. So on the one hand, of course, the, this type of abstraction level uh, leads to um, yeah, different type of information. But there's uh, significantly more. There are modalities which are static. For example, an image is, is static, but you might have other type of information where there's temporal or spar uh, spatial information, and you need to, to encode them. Then the, the representation space uh, can also be very, very different. So we have like language is a discrete one where you have typically words represented as, as, as integers. Or so. so in this case, we have a discrete representation space. Or if you think about the, the, um, the sentiment or so, if somebody's happy or not happy, that's also discrete. On the other hand, at least Initially, if you think about an audio signal, this is like a continuous signal and you need to uh, process that. Also, there are some which are directly interpretable, others are not interpretable. 
the, we, we talked uh, already about the amount of information that is in the different signal. That can also be very, very different. And uh, you have to deal with that as the same as a granularity, the noise that is in each signal and the relevance. Uh, so if you think about the initial example with uh, audiovisual um, speech recognition, of course, some of the audio signal is more important than the video signal. So you have to think about how you deal with it. How do you deal with situations where the information you get from both signals is not the same, where you might want to trust one signal more than, uh, than you want to trust um, another signal. And then it's interesting that these modalities also interact with each other. So it's not that you have always the same type of information and how they are combined can be different. On the one hand, you have uh, information which are redundant. So you have similar information in two modalities A and B. And then it can be that therefore following the result of the joint modality can be the same, or you can have some type of enhancement that you have a stronger um response to that then you have also the non-redundant uh, information so if a and b have different types of output uh, information then the question is how you combine them if you do you always trust then one like dominance like you always take a or is it like you have something emergent so that like based on both you have a different response a bit to the question answering you have the picture and the question and the joint of them will give you uh, some other type of information. Um, that this type of information fusion is also important for human uh, was, was um, already found out quite long time ago. And a lead is like nicely shown in this uh, famous McGurk effect. And that one, I guess it's best if I can just show it to you. I hope you can hear it. So I guess oh. So I guess most of you hopefully heard something different in both cases. Who did hear something different? Okay, that's uh, how it's expected is, is for me too. The, uh, also the case because we use both information, we use the audio information and we use the visual information and we're combining them in order to like, uh, understand what was saying. But in this case, uh, it was a thing that in both cases, the audio was exactly the same thing. So we are using then the visual information to disambiguate them because it's maybe difficult to disambiguate these things. And based on the lip movement, we will decide whether it's ba or va, uh, which sounds um, yeah, relatively similar, and, and therefore it's hard to disambiguate them directly. So also as humans, you see that we are really like merging or fusion, fusing these two, two types of information. And uh, yeah, we can benefit or of course also in some time be misled by, by doing this type of, uh, of fusion. Um, so based on this type of, of motivation, then the question is, um, yeah, how, how can we use this type of information in our some type of, of, of model? How can we also benefit from multilingual, from sorry, from multimodal input 
as as we as a human did it so you see before we are combining some of these type of information and of course it might be helpful to make more robust ai systems to also combine different types of information and also in order to solve new types of tasks and if we are looking what we've learned until now, we've seen different types of machine learning systems and generally they got some type of input if you remember, like we have the text classification and to sequence labeling, the other, the green one would be here text. And then we had a large machine learning model. And then we did some output, some classification, some labels or so. Or for speech recognition, the input was the, uh, the audio signal. Then we are doing some machine learning, le learning magic in between. And then we are getting our output signal. Um, nowadays, of course, it's also a bit of, of what we discussed before. Most of these machine learning models look like that. We're taking our input, then we're having our type of some type of, of neural net. I hope you can still remember we have this basic type of uh, neural network, for example, for, uh, for text processing, where you, you feed in and then often you get some types of hidden representations in between. So normally you not have one say you have not like one layer of neural network, you have different layers and you can have in between always this type of representations. And then at the final, you, you have the output. So do you remember how, how does these types of neural network representation look like typical? Any idea? So we had always these type of continuous vectors. So the hidden representations we had in, in, the, in the different neural networks where you get an input and then you're representing your input by some type of, of continuous vector, yes? Yes, that's exactly the first step that would be still more on the green side. But then you put it into the neural network and then in the neural network you always have these types of hidden vectors which is a fixed size vector with continuous continuous numbers in there and and to this one i would refer here and these ones you're then you uh, using for a lot of these different models and the nice thing is this you can nowadays do not only with text but with all the different types of modalities that's how most of these models look like you're putting in one or several inputs in there and then you're transforming them with a neural network if you look at the different layers you will always have this type of fixed size vectors maybe not one but several ones for example for each input you have one vector and then you're processing them for several iterations. And uh, then in the end, you do the prediction. And of course, all the blue and the yellow and the orange one, for example, all that is trained together. So you don't train them individually, but you train them what we refer to, what we refer to as end to end. So you give an input, you train it uh, to also do this prediction, which is the reference. So this is the standard uh, machine learning model for doing perception for any uh, or for many unimodal tasks. Um, now we are having a, a little bit of a different picture. So we are dealing with multimodal perception. So in this case, our input is not like just a single modality, but as we've seen in the initial examples, we have model different types of modalities. So we can have audio and text, or we can have audio and vision, or other types of modalities. And then we again want to put them somehow into the machine learning model that we have and generate some type of output. So that's still the general type of, um, of uh, um, yeah, model we are considering. And what we'll look into today now is mainly the question, what do we have to change about our machine learning model in order to deal with this? So that we are not having a single modality input, then having one different type of large network to process that, but having other types of models in order to do this type of prediction. And thereby we will look into uh, three different scenarios of why we are using multimodal input. 
the one thing, the once the first scenario we'll look into is a case where we are having redundant information. So that is when at least most of the information are available in different uh, modalities. Then we can have the more complementary type of information where we have different types of information in the different types of models. And then we have one last interesting uh, type of, of uh, application where in the, in the inference, we are only using one type of um, modality. However, during training, we will have several modalities in order to do some type of knowledge transfer. So what do I mean by that? In the case of redundant information, think of it like in the emotion, multimodal emotion recognition test. You can do multimodal and uh, you can do emotion recognition by just having an audio signal and then predicting the output modality. You can also do the same thing with just the video. So you can do good, do very good um, single modality emotion recognition by video only and then by the uh, generating the output. And then the aim is now if we are doing multimodal, we have two informations and want to predict the output. And of course, the question is, how can we make this now stronger? So the, the, why we're using it, we want to have a better performing system, which can use this type of two informations, where maybe some information are easier to extract from the one signal, and other informations are easier to extract from the other type of information. And the main challenge in this type of a system is how do we fuse, fuse the information? So how do we combine information from the different modalities? And we look there, there's mainly three different types of fusion. So how early in the network do we want to fuse it? So we can do it very at the beginning that we directly somehow combine the input. We can dry, do it more in the middle that we combine the hidden representation, or we can do it at the end that we're combining the output. A different scenario is the thing when we have complementary information. That was the, the visual question answering. There, we cannot do experiments only on the picture. So you cannot do predicting that the answer is blue by just having the picture, and you cannot answer the question by having text. So in this case, we always need to have uh, these two information in order to then do our prediction and predicting uh, what is uh, the correct answer. Um, and then there is the final use case, and that is uh, knowledge transfer. And uh, an example for this is what is referred to as zero-shot image classification. And the task in this case is we want to do an image classification. For example, in this test, the image is, hopefully you can see it a bit, a bit is a cat. And so you want to classify this image as a cat. Uh, so this is a unimodal task. You have one modality input, and you want to predict that is uh, th th that the cat is. However, one challenge with image classification that it's typically a closed class task. So you have a fixed set of classes, and then you can classify all of these classes as maybe you have the classes dogs, cats, and mouse and then you can only classify this. But ha what happens if you see there now a new type of class, how like new type of image, how could you deal with this? And there the idea is, okay, can we gain from multimodal input? So again, think about these representations we had in the neural network. Can we, and then we look, can we make the representations of images and of words somehow similar to each other? So that, uh, that the representation of the word cat is similar to the representation of the word of the picture cat and so on. And if we then see a new image, which is belonging to something which you haven't seen before, like here, the cat, we can look in the neighborhood, which is the nearest, um, nearest word around this image, and then do a classification of this image without having seen exactly this case before. So if we want to yeah, address this um, yeah, different types of, of tasks, what are the main, main challenges we have to address? And we'll look into uh, mainly three challenges here. The first is how do we represent? So how do we represent the different types of modalities? 
how do we represent words how do we represent images how do do we represent uh, visual and audio information so that the model is able to somehow combine them and learn from all these different types of uh, information and thereby we will concentrate today on more neural approaches because that's uh, what, what is mainly the, the current work on so it's again we are using some type of neural network to then learn this type of representation I told you a vector which has a fixed size dimension typically. And the nice thing is if we have these vectors, we might be able to somehow combine them. Uh, the next challenge is then um, the, the type of information we, we, we saw, it will not always be the same. So we have different structure of information. So it can be that uh, there's more um, data points in the one modality than the other. There's structure in that, like here. So we have different boxes uh, assigned to words. So then we need to learn some type of alignment so that the blue box is referring to the newspaper and the red box is referring to the woman and so on. So the question is, how can we learn these types of alignments? in order to make best of these deals again if you think about if you want to like represent everything in a similar embedding space that is of course where we in the end uh, want to end and then the final challenge is the transfer so how can we transfer information between different modalities uh, one example is is the example we just mentioned so if we learn know something about words and they are in the sum of the same space between words and uh, and images. How can we do this transfer so that it's possible to answer or like to retrieve similar example? But first, start with a with the first challenge, uh, where the first challenge uh, was um, about the the fusion of the or the representation. So how can we learn representations that are somehow um yeah cross model and and model the interactions between the different uh, modalities and uh, one first sub challenge in this is a fusion so in this case we want to learn representations where information from two or more modalities are fused into one joint representation so we want to somehow yeah get all the information from the different modalities we have and merge them into like one joint representation so we have all information from the different uh, representation and in this type of fusions as i mentioned before there is like different ways of the time when we do the fusion and they of course have both their advantages and disadvantages and depending on the tasks you might prefer the one or you might uh, prefer the other one. Um, a first thing where, or like the, the first thing you can do is maybe the easiest. Yeah, we have all the information, ju just put them directly together. So this is referred to as, as fusion of the raw modalities. So we directly take the inputs, the two inputs we have, and try to concatenate them, for example, put them together, and then, um, yeah, process them together in the in the future of the of the network so for example if you think about the multimodal emotion recognition you take always a time step of your video of your audio signal you somehow put these two signals together and then you do your processing further and and, and do the joint process the the main challenge is in this case of course that the uh the, these representations are very different can be that there are different size, like an image, for example, typically it has more information than just like an audio signal. And also the, the question is, how do you have an alignment? So if they have different time step size, all that might be, be very challenging. However, it's of course also very easy because from the model perspective, it's, uh, it's quite straightforward. If we know how to put things together, we can then use, just use our standard model. So if you again, look at from the, from the general perspective uh, we have our modalities a b and c at different time steps and then this green blue and purple information we would fuse or concatenate to our representation in yellow and that is then our fused representation so the joint representation of the information at this time step 
of all the three different modalities and we put all these into our machine learning model and then do the prediction and then we see the the advantage of course in this case is that the um the model is uh very similar to what we had before. So we are still getting now mainly one type of input and we need to process it to do our prediction. To be more concrete, for example, if we do the multimodal emotion information, we would put somehow the image and the audio signal into it, put it together, then do our multimodal system and th then do the uh, prediction. Um, in recent years, with the the yeah advancement in neural processing, and we we anyway often do some type of neural processing, where we then in the next step get some type of hidden representation. So we have these types of hidden representations anyway out there. So of course, then another idea would be, oh, maybe it's better to first do some type of mapping on each modality individually to learn a representation for each modality, which hopefully is then a lot more similar because the model might have extracted already the important information, which we can unimodally extract from that. And then the output is always some type of hidden vector. So it's always a continuous vector, which might be a lot easier than to combine. Furthermore, we can use then large amounts of, of unimodal data. So again, think typically you have more data in the unimodal case than in the modal, because it's just easier to record audio, to record a video, than to always record all different modalities or only having text. So you can have a model which only takes one modality. You can then um, use only this modality, learn an intermediate representation, then combine these representation and use that. So in a picture, this looks like here. So we start again with our three initial um, uh, inputs. Each of them is passed through a unimodal model, which learns some type of hidden representation for each of these modalities. And then we're having to do something of how to combine them. We're combining these representations into a joint representation. And then based on that, we can do then our, our final uh, prediction of, uh, of what the, the, the final model is. And there are, of course, very different ways of how we combine them. The typical things are additive interactions. So you just add up the two vectors in some, with some weights. You can also multiply them, or you can have more gated interactions, where the idea is that you learn, like in which cases, it might be better to trust one network or it might be trust to another modality. So it's again like the if you think about the audiovisual speech recognition that the model can learn if it's very noisy, then you should trust more the, more the image. And in other cases, you should trust more the audio. Again, for our initial example of the uh, multimodal emotion recognition, uh, here is, 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 is the example again. So we have now the audio, we have the video, then we have an audio and video encoder, which generates our hidden representations, which are just these two vectors, or if it's audio and, and over time, it will be a, a sequence of vectors for the audio and a sequence of vectors for the video. We combine both of them and put them then into our multimodal uh, emotion recognition system in order to predict then the, the emotion. And our system again is, so it's then a neural, can be for example, a neural network again, where you put in your, uh, your uh, um, hidden states and, and generate an output. Of course, the, the advantage is in this case, these two are hidden representations, which might be more similar than what we have if we would have take the initial uh, model. The last type of uh, approach is the, the late fusion. That means we're having two separate models and, and each of them does a prediction and then we're combining the prediction. The nice thing is that we can of course then do unimodal models, train them independent of each other and then join the predictions. Um, of course, it only works if we can do unimodal prediction. And uh, secondly, 
we are not really modeling any type of interaction. For example, that you more trust the model when it's louder than you more trust the vision or so is more difficult. But from the, from the picture here, it would be um, like this, that you have three types of inputs. Then you have three types of independent, independent unimodal models. They all predict you some probability. So that y is zero or one, for example. And then you merge these ones. Again, it can be uniformal merge. It can also be that you put some weights on, on past experience, but then you can merge all of these predictions to do a late fusion. Or in this type of um, uh, multimodal emotion recognition, we would two, have two independent systems. Which one does emotion recognition on the the speech side, one does it on the visual side, and then you try to combine both predictions to have the overall prediction uh, of both models. Um, before we are coming to the yeah, second part about what you else can do with this type of uh, representation or what is challenges, are there more questions about this type of information fusion? Yeah? Yeah. I mean, of course, I mean, the, the concatenation is the easiest thing to do. And especially if you know, think that you have very different types of inputs, that's normally the easiest. But if you have good ways of combining them differently, you could also do it do it different, so it's not. But then, of course, I mean, of course, there's also not this hard uh, border. So the more processing you do beforehand, then of course it's getting more into the abstract fusion. Uh, so there is no hard boundaries. It's more like conceptual in general. If this is the idea, yeah. I mean, this is of course, there's there's again, sorry, different ways. So it depends on, do you have training data to train that? If you don't have training data, I normally you just do something like majority vote. So you're, you're just adding up the probabilities. Uh, if you have training data, you can of course learn where, so here, that was, was here more the case that we just do the average. Uh, if you have training data and you can train and learn how to trust each one, you can have a more complicated condition and then of course more trust one model or the other model. Um, the other question is that is oh one question oh thanks we can why can the combination of predictions in the last step with different weights not be seen as interaction? Um, yes yes you're right it can be some type of interaction but of course yeah there's less type of interaction the the earlier you merge it you can have a lot more complicated interaction than just like weighting them so you can really like learn what yeah different types of information from the uh, symbol how they interact with each other so otherwise you only have one prediction and that is all the type of interaction you can do um sorry so yeah, the, the other thing is, can we learn representation that are somehow uh, coordinated so that representations from different modalities are in the same space so we can interchange them and work with information from different modalities. So the idea is that you have something like this. So you have green uh, representations in the one uh, um, modality and you have blue representations in the other modality. And if you then look at the uh, shared space, you want that the representation of somehow the same event, of course, what the same event is can be, uh, can be different on the different tasks are similar to each other. One example was that, yeah, if you have the word dog and you have the image of a dog that you want this to these two representations are somehow similar. Of course, it's not that straightforward because 
in the word dog, you only have the dog. In, the, in a picture of the dog, you have a lot more information. You know the color of the dog, you know the background. So it's not, yeah, that straightforward. But the idea is, can we learn representations so that at least all images of a dog are somehow near to the word of the dog um, and so on. And this is uh, helpful for both for things like multimodal question answering, because in modal modal question answering, we can't really do a fusion. It's not that we have the same information on the text and on the image, but like it's complementary information, which we both need in order to answer the question or in things like zero shot image classification. Um, how can we um, do that or how can we learn that? So the idea is first a more similar, simple example. Imagine we have pairs of uh, two of the same event observed from different modalities. So you know the word dog and you have associated a picture of a dog. You know that you have the word cat and you have a picture of the cat and so on. Then the idea is, can we now train individual encoders for both modalities and then we learn these encoders in a way that the representations afterwards are somehow similar to each other. So from the, from the picture view that, that looks like um, this one, uh, we will have uh, the one modality in green. We are having a encoder. So we have again, this type of um, uh, yeah, hidden representation. And then we're summing, uh, we're having a co coordination function which tries to achieve that these ty two types of representations, the first green one and the first blue one, which are aligned, are very similar, and the second green one and the second blue one. How can we make them more similar? For example, we can minimize the cosine distance. So we can now train these encoders in order to get representations so that these two representations are, are most similar. So we would train these two neural networks, the blue ones here, to learn a mapping so that the, the representations of the same event are as similar as possible. Can we do that by just training them to minimize, to make these two representations most similar? Or do you see any problem if we would use a training and try to train these two neural networks to learn a function that these two paired examples are always mo as similar as possible. Do you see any challenge? Yes? Yes. So uh, the, the, this simple solution, of course, could lead there to that we're just learning to map everything to zero, 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 zero. Then your loss would be zero. You would uh, everything would be the same, but it's not very, very helpful. So there are different ways of uh, of uh, addressing that. Either you can have additional losses, so you can they should be the same, similar, but you also want that they perform some type of task where they then cannot be that similar. The other thing is that you free some parts. So for example, you keep the, the upper encoder the same. So this one is not changed. So you have them all separate by, by this type of encoder. And then you're only allowed to, to train the lower one. And then of course it can just map everything to the same because that would be bad, but it has to map it to the, uh, to the different uh, things. Uh, sorry, that was the wrong direction. Um, then you can also have something else. You can try to improve it by now we only try to make similar things similar. What you can also try to do in addition is to make dissimilar things not the same. So you have another an additional loss term so that representations which are not belonging to each other are as far away as possible. So you try to make these ones uh, more uh, more dissimilar. This is referred to as as a contrastive loss, which can help to make the model better. Uh, what can you do with this? You can do very nice um, uh, additional task with this. This is one example where people looked into this visual semantic embeddings. So you have here a visual and a language embedding and you can combine them. So if you have an embedding, a vector, of course you can add and subtract them. So you can, for example, take this blue 
car here. And then you can do minus blue plus red. And then you have it in somewhere else in your vector space. And then you can find your nearest neighbors. So which are the pictures which are most similar to this? And you nicely see that you have here red car, uh, red cars then around it. Um, or you can have a, a, a bus and then you do minus yellow plus red. And then you have red trucks. So it seems not to have that many red buses. So you see here's partly a fire tra trunk track. Uh, but but you see in, in general the idea. So it's able to do some of these these embeddings and really learn a representation where these different words are and words and images are embedded in the same space. So you can do more fancy things with. Um, now we have the representations. Of course, there are still some additional challenges. One is the alignment. So it's not that we always, it's easy. There's a one-to-one -one map between each modality. So the number of tokens or events or uh, individual things you have in both modalities can be different. So you need to somehow align the text and the audio or the vision and the audio and so on. Um, or for example, in, in image, you need to align like boxes to uh, two words. And the first thing you can do is doing it in a supervised way. That's a bit as we did it before, as we talked about it. So you can have a supervised type of uh, label so you know individually which are aligned to each other. And then you can do supervised learning in order to learn that similar things get together and dissimilar get, get out of each other, and then you can do the thing we mentioned with the image at the beginning. So you even take a unimodal model, and then in order to do the classification, you're embedded in the joint space, and here you look which is the nearest word to each other. And people have done that for zero-shot image classification um, that is, is shown here. Uh, so you see the words. It's a bit small, I guess, but you see here in in green, the words. So uh, this should be truck, I think. This is deer. This is dog. And then you see the the different images. So the, the red thing is a cat. And the orange one is a deer. And uh, you have an airplane. And here, for example, are the pictures of airplanes. And you see that the word is also within this. So there you, again, have used this alignment to align the different spaces from the uh, image and from the words in order to have a joint shared space. More difficult, of course, it is if you don't have alignment information. There are also works trying to do that. So if you don't have uh, alignment, you have to have a global look and somehow learn, have some bias in there again. What is a good alignment between us that somehow each word is each entry from the one is best aligned to only one, minimizing some things. But of course, that is, is more complicated. Um, and an additional challenge in this type of alignment is then, of course, if we have continuous alignment. So we're not always having discrete things, but we might have continuous. I mean, if you think of ASR, of course, you have already discretized your signal. But still, the number of signals in an audio representation is significantly more than you have in a text. So the, the length of your signal is, is much larger, and you need to see how you can, can do this type of alignment. And what you then typically do is doing some type of segmentation on the, on the audio side so that you segment your, your audio signal into representations, and then you can again align them to words or so. Then you have here, you see on the word side, you only have three signals, but on the um, text side, you have um, six signals, and then you can first segment it to also have only three signals, and then they are matching uh, to each other. With this, we would then come to the last part where it's about transfer. So how can we now transfer information from the different modalities. But before we come to that, is there any more questions about the previous part? Okay, 
then we want to look at um, yeah uh, two examples how we can transfer um, um, information and the one case is we might have a uni unimodal model which can perform various tasks and one of these models are large language models for example uh, we will discuss them later but these models are nowadays able to not only do one task but depending how we started they can continue the sentence and thereby perform different uh, tasks and then the question is can you also transfer this to uh, deal with multimodal um, inputs so what do I mean with different abilities? For example, so this is a, a, a large standard language model is just predicting the next token. However, you can use it to, for example, do something like translation or question answer. People refer to the, the idea of zero shot question, uh, translation then like this. So you give the language model the starting sentence, translate English to French, double dots and then cheese, and then an arrow, and then you look what is the most probable next word. And this, these large language models are trained on multilingual, multilingual data, different things. We, you see it as very large models. So the other next word then predicted is uh, fromage. So it's somehow able to do a very simple type of translation by just continuing your sequence. As a language model, as, as we have discussed it before, you can even improve this by when not doing zero shot translation, uh, zero shot models, but one shot. And the idea in one shot is, oh, we're giving it an example of what we mean by translation, and then it's hopefully even better. So we said, translate English to French, then we give him in one example how he should translate sea otter, and then we giving it the start with cheese, and then typically these things will even be better. We will look in the in the. We will see this type of models further in the next type of how we learn. But for now, just assume, okay, this is like a unimodal models for text only. Large neural networks are able to do some of these type of of um, yeah, finishing up. So the question is, can we now somehow enable this also to work with multimodal information? so that it can transfer its abilities not only to text, but also to, for example, imaging. And uh, people have chosen, uh, tried that in this Frozen, and there the idea is we are extending our language model to also handle visual input, and then we are training it to align the vision with the text by just having some type of aligned text image pair. So often this is an image with a description of the image, image, for example, here of the image, and then a small red boat on the water is the description. So how, are, how is it done? So we are taking the image, we're having our vi visual encoder here, which is also fed into our language model. And then the language model continues with predicting this type of, um, uh, the type of sentence. The nice thing is, if we are trying to learn that, it should learn again representations here for image and for sp for speech, which are similar to each other. So that again, the representation of this picture is similar to the representation of a red boat in the water. So then we have learned, so, so we are learning this joint model, we are learning only this part, and the only thing that we are learning here is to have similar representation. And then the transfer idea is, can we now do similar things as we did with the language model in monolingual? Can we now do, do, do this in the multilingual model? And the nice thing is in some model, this is working. So what we can do then is we put in the picture, we put in a question, question, what color is this car? and the output of the model is then blue. So we can do then visual question answering even in a zero shot fashion. So it's never has learned to do really question answering. We have, don't have to build a complex model of doing visual question answering, but just by having similar representations between these two, it's able to do uh, something like that. And um, 
we can even improve it by again showing him what is the right way of doing it. So we are first giving in one example. So we're giving a plane and then we ask who invented it. And then, and the answer is the White brothers. And then we're giving another picture and we are asking who invented it. And then the system hopefully will answer Steve Jobs. So it's again, the idea of, yeah, we're having a joint space. We have learned question answering on text. Can we transfer this knowledge about how to do question answering to then the multimodal tasks? So in this case, the, the transfer is mainly that we, we have trained a joint model for vision and text, and we have a text model which can do question answering. And by combining them, now we can also do visual question answering. So we can also do task which we have only learned uh, on, on one type of uh, modality. One other task of learning is this type of uh, co-learning uh, where the idea is um, that uh, as, as we described in the, in the beginning, we only have in uh, the, the, the inference. So we only want to do a unimodal task. We want to do image classification. We want to classify images in different classes. However, we have limited training data on this modality. So the question is, can we improve by having more data in another modality in this type text? So normally there's a lot more data in text. So uh, the idea is we are, we are training our other modality. So we are training word vectors for just different types of words, only on words. Then we are in the second step doing this learning of shared representation, the coordination. So that the representation of the image and the words are similar. So that words are in the same area as, as images, as you see here. So here is a car, here's horse, here's dog, and so on. And so if we are now landing with our image in an area which is not covered by the training data, we can then look, okay, which words are around it. And since we have hopefully learned a very good representation, then we can also classify this. So this typically only works if it's somehow related. So if you have dog in your training data, it might work because dog and cats are at least somehow related. If you have very different words, it's more challenging and, and might not work um, that well. But in this case, uh, that's why it's co-learning. So the idea is we really want to solve only one task where this modality isn't used as an input and it's there only for training. While in the other case, uh, we're having both modalities, both in training and in testing. Um, good. Um, then uh, I will finish my part. So we'll see a lot more nice use cases of multimodal things soon by, by Professor Weibel. Just one last thing from my side. Okay, doesn't work. So I just wanted to have the, now there it is. Okay, so just as a summary, so what we learned until now. So we looked into motor model representations. We looked into how we can represent different parts different modalities of partly also in the same space in order to solve tasks where different modalities are involved. We also looked into fusion, so how to combine information from different modalities in order to yeah, be more robust and, and do it better. And then how to transfer knowledge from one task to another, because it's typically always one of the biggest challenges that we don't have all the information in one modality and we need to transfer them uh, between uh, different modalities. And with this, I will then hand over to Alex. Yeah. 
einloggen. Sekunde. Das Two-Factor Authentication machen. Okay. Uh, screen share. All right, always takes a while to switch laptops. Now, hopefully we'll in business. Okay, can you see that? Okay, thanks Jan. What I wanna do with that little time that we have here towards the end is show you a few um, additional ways of thinking about multimodal. And um, with that, let me actually show you, I still get an echo, but we have keep having this. Um, a little bit of history. There's a conference of uh, ICMI, International Conference of Multimodal Interfaces. Uh, if you want to publish in this area and have papers, uh, that's where you would probably go and publish. It's now an ACM conference, but it turns out it was started in China in 1996. I was part of that uh, founding committee um, uh, together with Gao Wen, a uh, well-known professor in China and has then uh, merged with a number of other conferences, PUI, Perceptual User Interfaces, MLMU, uh, and Speech and Gesture Workshop. So a couple of conferences have merged and it's now all part of this ICMI. It's a large conference, has 1,200 attendees. So if you want to publish in this area, that's the, the place to go and to publish. So it's a good conference. That's as way of advertising. Now, again, much of this has probably been said already by uh, Jan, um, the question why multimodal interfaces is that in the end, you've, we, we uh, told you about speech recognition and text, and you have other lectures in uh, image processing and video. But if you really look at how humans learn to communicate, then we realize it's not one or the other. We don't sit in a room for 20 years and do speech, and then we switch to the vision field and vice versa. But what we do, it just all happens at the same time. And we learn all of these different modalities. And it's ultimately not only speech and vision even, but as you can see, it's touch, it's looking at the other person and so on. And so this is what I wanna uh, touch on a little bit is why are we doing this and how do we do it? Um, it's not a single channel, a channel. It's rich in a very rich signal. Again, it's, it's more than actually one or two modalities even. Um, it's rich in context. We get a lot of context from this and has a lot of information. And why is it important? Well, multiple ch channels give us redundancy, first of all. Uh, we get better performance and robustness, and that's what you've seen in the, um, uh, in the discussion that Jan has presented is when we take actually multiple modalities, your, your, your performance will get better because you're looking at the same facts in the world 
both from different modalities. You can have text, you can have vision, and if you merge the two, you do a better job. But it also has redundancy. Sometimes one of the information is not available and we as humans can then switch back and forth. And that's something we want to exploit. And then the complementarity that you can use one modality to, for example, correct or complement the other one. And for that, I want to show you a few examples so that you get the full picture of uh, why multimodal is such a fascinating field. The first thing you need to realize is when we look at human computer interfaces, most of the time we, look, we believe that it's me sitting in front of the computer and entering something into a computer. Or in many of the examples you've seen, it's really you take some media, for example, where you have a, a YouTube video, let's say, with, where you have image and uh, speech at the same time, and then you fuse the two. Um, but it's really only two of these things that we mentioned because you have in, in the case of human to machine, you have interaction, but you have also um, questions and queries in the internet. If you use chat GPT or the other language models, you may be querying things. And then you have an in, a rich interaction in the actual uh, human space where many people interact with each other. And you might even have robots and machines interacting at the same time as well. And in that case, we have an additional challenge, namely it's not just purely fusing two signals, but it's also selecting which one actually matters and which one is uh, uh, directed to whom. Who am I even talking to? If I'm in a space here, uh, am I talking to A or talking to B? And depending on that, it means different things. So who is talking to who, when and why and, and what about? is one of these big issues that is fundamentally different from a human computer interface where the purpose is really very easy. You sit in front of the machine or even what we're doing right now with the lecture translator, it's straightforward. I have a speech signal, it goes into the machine, I translate and when I'm done, I turn it off. That's not how human life goes because you, you change and you talk to some, your neighbor, you talk to somebody else and who is actually intended by it is an open question that we need to address if it's really an open environment for um, these systems. Modality, multimodality, as you can see, is actually very rich. It's not, um, as I said, not just image, even within images, there are different purposes. You can have, for example, road signs, they meet, meet something. These pictures up here, I took years ago in, when traveling through China, when we collected the database of Chinese road signs. And I found out later that this road sign means no entry for tourists, which of course is uh, interesting when you come as a foreigner, as a tourist, <laughs> you have a Chinese sign that you can't read uh, and it says no entry for tourists. But we do other things. For example, we can observe the lips when someone is speaking. We actually subconsciously also watch the lips of another person. And we use that for speech recognition and identification, whether someone is speaking or not. And then, for example, when you're interacting in a, in a room, you might actually have whiteboards and interact with handwriting recognition. Body language and facial expression. So I show you this picture. For those of you who are Germans, you know who that is. Uh, is former Chancellor Angela Merkel, and she clearly distinguishes herself by the kinds of gestures she does. It it's allows you to identify the person and the, the kind of look, look and feel of it. But we also signal different things. We can uh, give a particular gesture signal, and it means something in addition to what we say and what we see. We can express emotion, as you can see here, where one person can express disgust, joy, happiness, just purely from the facial expression. And as we will see also from the visual expression. And as you can see, that's heavily used by politicians who can express their emotion even without saying anything and thereby sneakily increase their speaking times because the cameras love watching this sort of thing. And so uh, in fact, in the last, debate uh, on the on one of the elections uh, that was in some sense an unfair advantage. As I showed you before in some of the examples that we have shown. I don't know if we have this K-O-S-S-M-A-N. Yep, we do again. Don't know why it always switches back. So I may have shown this to you. That's a spelling recognizer we built with TDNs in 93. Of course, now you can do this much more 
powerfully in large networks, continuous speech. I may have shown that last time. So let me show you this. This is handwriting, again, 1993 with simple methods, but handwriting is one of those modalities you may want to add. Handwriting, for example, has two different forms. One is you can put it on a temp tablet or on a screen, right directly on the screen, or you, you may potentially observe it as somebody writes on paper in front of you on a whiteboard. Or you may just get a bitmap, in which case handwriting is yet another challenge when you don't observe in which sequence it was written. This type of handwriting recognition is like speech because you get a signal that is a, is a function of time. We're going to discuss this in the neural network lecture. So the, in that case, it's like, like uh, speech because you get a signal as a function of time. But if you get a bitmap where handwritten text appears, then you have to process it as a bitmap. And again, it's a challenge because it's very confusing or ambiguous, just like speech is. Now, how do we combine these things? So this is again, something rather old, but still unsolved in most interfaces, which is cross-modal repair. We just watch this for a second and I will explain it. So what's going on here? So what would we can do is cross-modal repair. Let's say you have one modality where you're writing. What you've seen so far is when you fuse two signals when they're present at the same time. In many situations, you find one signal creating errors or misunderstandings. And we as humans and machines can use, to, use the other modality to fix it or to correct it. Why is this advantageous? Because the signals have different ambiguities and thereby are complementary. For example, if I say yang and wang, for example, then yang and wang may be very confusable acoustically. But if I spell it y-a-n-g or w-a-n-g, the acoustic signals of those two sequences are very different. So if we switch to another modality like spelling, uh, a, a, an ambiguity in one modality is no longer there and we can use it to correct. The same is true here with handwriting recognition when you've seen, seen it. So if something is confusable in one domain, like this Y and W, for example, in continuous speech, if you switch to handwriting recognition, suddenly it's no longer ambiguous, and we can use that to disambiguous. We actually wrote two patents on this a uh, long time ago, so the patents are by now already run out, but uh, you, could, you, uh, you can see in those patents that we propose that you can use one modality to correct the other one because of that complementarity. So something that's confusing in one modality may not be confusing in the other. And in so doing, we can actually use one to correct the other. Again, a very powerful possibility for um, multimodality. That too, flashback to very old slides. Again, this was happened in the 90s where we did the very fusion that uh, Jan was talking about uh, for another task, which is lip reading. So you take here hidden nodes or hidden representations, you merge the hidden uh, nodes and hidden representations at one uh, at, at some layer in between. And again, there's the early fusion and the late fusion uh, already back then when you can either fuse the input signals, you can fuse one of the layers in between, or you fuse it at a higher layer, in this case at the phonemic layer. What was the challenge here? The challenge here was to recognize speech in very noisy environments. Let's, uh, let's assume I am speaking to you, but then suddenly the noise increases. We know from human perception that people actually do that. So we know from human perception, if you increase the noise, people subconsciously wind up starting to look at the other person more intensely. Why? Because we subconsciously read the lips of the other person to complement the acoustic signal to see what is likely or what is possible in the signal. So this was actually done, as I said, a long time ago already uh, by combining the speech recognition accuracy of a speech task 
uh, you see the uh, acoustic signals, the, the green. And if you're now adding a lot of noise, then the green obviously gets worse. The visual is unaffected by the acoustic noise. And so the performance stays the same. Recognizing phonemes or sounds or letters in, a, in visual is obviously not as good as in speech. So if I say a, a particular word and you only read my lips, then the performance will not be as good. But if you combine it with the acoustic signals, you can actually get a big boost by combining the two. And it mimics what we know of humans by combining actually these two things, uh, these two signals in actual communication, lip reading and acoustic speech. It's surprising perhaps, because in this case, we're really only talking about speech. And if we're saying, I want to recognize speech by reading lips and the, to know that this actually helps, then um, it may perhaps be a bit uh, surprising. It's part of a larger phenomenon, which we call the cocktail party effect. Cocktail party effect is a still unsolved problem in communication. If I am in a cocktail party and I'm standing around, it's really noisy, loud music, a lot of people talking, and I'm speaking to you and we, we're interacting, then I'm actually magically able to listen to just one person that I'm talking to. And in the next moment, I might switch gear and talk, talk to someone else and listen to them. And I no longer hear the other person and I hear that other conversation. How do we do this? So we do this partially by lip reading, we know that, but also by binaural uh, e hearing. We have two ears after all. And we also use uh, semantics and uh, of the conversation and even the voice patterns of the speaker we're listen listening to. So we're ac actally able to multimodally um, focus in on one person. Now, multimodality is not just merging speech and images for classification. There's other meta-level information we like to, to obtain when we're interacting with people. If I'm interacting with another person, it's not just enough to know what they said. As we said in the speech lecture, remember we talked about pitch and intensity. We filtered it for uh, speech to text processing, but I told you already, this is no longer true if we want to get meta-level information about a dialogue, for example. In that case, we want to, for example, uh, detect emotion. Emotion, once again, is a multimodal signal. If I'm listening to another person, I can listen to their voice and see if the voice is, has a certain emotion and I can look at their face. I showed you earlier examples of an angry face and a happy face. And we can combine that now, of course, with a speech that is happy and angry. So depending on in how you say this, it's always the same sentence, you transmit a different emotion that we can classify from speech. And we did this again, uh, it was the first paper ever to do this in uh, 1996. And since then that has also grown into a large research area to detect emotion in speech, to detect emotion in faces, and then fuse the two again to get the, an emotional classification of the person. We actually use a third dimensionality of, of this classification, which is text. So if we fuse prosody, the acoustic signal, the pitch in intensity with text and face from the th three sources, we can actually get a pretty good uh, estimate and a, a pretty good classification of the emotion of a speaker. At the time, this was already done on over some database with 70% accuracy. And we just had that recently again re replicated on Twitter data, um, a master, uh, master thesis that happened just two, two, three years ago, where we repeated that with Twitter data, where again, you combine text with the acoustics of that, of that speech. And once again, we can reach about 70, 80% correct um, emotion classification. Now the implication and the, the, what you can do with this is of course very rich. You can use that for dialogue processing, but a number of other things as well. So the remaining minutes, let me just show you a few projects that we have done on this. And we we'll actually have several proposals where we're repeating this or where we're trying to expand on this. It was a project Fame and Chill uh, by the EU, where we really looked at people in offices to try to bring together all these different modalities to process and to understand what they're doing and to actually do certain jobs with it. So in one case, for example, we built a so-called connector, which is the uh, experience we all have. We sit in a meeting and suddenly the phone rings 
and the phone is ringing at the worst possible moment and interrupts everybody. So why couldn't we have a telephone that knows that you're currently busy? Obviously we can put it by hand in today's iPhones, but if you had a telephone that knew that you're in a, uh, at the moment in a meeting uh, and knew whether the call is important or not, it could in fact prevent this. Another thing is a memory jog as we, uh, we sometimes don't remember the name of a person and we don't remember when we actually talk to them. And the memory jog is something that whispers in my ear, oh, you met that person yesterday and you talked about such and such and uh, this person works for you <laughs> or is in some kind of context. That sort of inf additional information is yet another service we can do, but one, again, it requires multimodal processing, even more so if information is multilingual as people are talking. So we can collect data and from that data derive the functional information in such a scene. So for example, if we know who is there, what they're pointing to, where they are moving, what are they doing, to whom they're talking, uh, what the environment is and what they are saying, the combination of all of the, these things gives us a lot of information that pure speech recognition doesn't do. At the time we built such an environment, a smart room, we're doing that now again because we're preparing for some new projects where we want to advance this state of the art. We built face trackers already in the early days. Um, and uh, we have some videos. I don't have time to show them to you, but here you see we had the first fastest uh, face tracker at the time in the world. It's still a very highly cited paper because it was uh, original. And then uh, our colleague Rainer Stiefelhagen, who you know in vision processing, he did his PhD thesis on this topic where we took a 360 degree um, camera with, with a parabolic mirror. And then you get uh, images like this where you have uh, people sitting around a table and by observing their face, notice this was a while ago, so the resolution is very good, but not very good, but by watching in which direction they are looking, you see the face direction changes, we can actually tell who someone is looking at in order to understand what the speech signal actually means. If I say, can you turn off the, can you please shut down your computer? Can you please to shut down your computer? If I look at you, you know that I mean you and not you here in the back there. Of course, I can supplement that with additional information like the name or emotion and so on, but all of that information plays together and we need that visual information as well. Now, all of this was again uh, advanced by uh, tracking people in uh, office environments. This is a later picture that uh, 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 Rainer Stiefelhagen developed in, uh, in his work to actually get it with a camera that is, uh, is disconnected or in a different location to uh, find out where a person is actually focusing on, where a person is looking at. And this is key information that we then need to do things like, for example, um, videos in, with dialogue. For example, when we're saying, uh, turn on this light, turn off that light, and we want to fi find where the hands are and where the faces are in order to get pointing gestures uh, in a space. We are doing this now with robots, for example. We want to develop a pointing uh, detector where we say, please robot, put move this over here. Imagine what we would need to know to be able to do that. We need to recognize the speech and we need to have the pointing gesture and bring this all together into one uh, understanding. All of this again was then also tested in large rooms where we have uh, person recognition, face recognition, understanding uh, who they are talking to. Uh, and all of this is multimodal. We call it even fleximodal. What is the difference between multimodal and fleximodal? Sometimes information is not available and you need to flexibly switch between modalities. If I'm putting my hands in front of my mouth, you don't know, you cannot watch my face, but you can still recognize my voice. And by not seeing my face, by, by my voice, you can still know who I am. I can stop talking and you can watch my face and you can still this, recognize who I am by switching to image processing. And so we do this here by recognizing faces by voice or by speech in a continuum, because, you know, if I suddenly disappear behind the 
um, thing and I come back out and you see me just as a face, you still know it's the same person. So we use all of these multi, multimodal signals to be able to track people, identify them and see what they're ta talking and why they're talking and what, what it's about. All of this was used in early navigation systems where we, uh, you can see the clunky hardware we had at the time. Uh, it, it became more modern with visual. So these are all devices we use. You can get heads up display glasses, for example, where we can get text projected into glasses. Uh, this was an early road sign detector, uh, and a later one now is being offered by Google. And here two pro uh, text projected into glasses could translate already. We showed that for the first time in 2005, and now Google Glass has done something similar. We also can have directed audios. These are loudspeakers that you can only hear in one part of the uh, audience. So we can put a loudspeaker here in this room that only you can hear and the rest cannot. So we could give you, for example, uh, whatever Spanish and we could give you Chinese and we could put German and uh, English in different rooms or without uh, uh, headphones and project the sound. We have stopped doing this because that type of audio apparently is not without risks. It can hurt your hearing. It's very high power, uh, but we worked on this. Now the widest and craziest maybe is electromyographic signals. We can put all, for example, sensors on the cheek and observe the muscle movement or sensors on our head to get uh, the, um, the electric currents in our head to identify what people are thinking about or what they're saying. Here's an example, for example, of such speech where we can um, have people talk So this person So what are we doing here? This person is in a meeting but doesn't want to speak loudly because it's in the middle of the meeting, so they just move their lips. I'm in a meeting. And by moving your mouth and your lips in a certain way, we can you we can classify and recognize the electrical currents in the cheek and then tr do the recognition with that and transmit that over the telephone. So the other person can then hear your voice, but you don't disturb the meeting that you're in. And we can even translate it. I don't have time to give you the translation example of that. But if you don't speak the other language, you can just whisper or move your lips in English and get a voice output in Chinese, let's say. Now, the last example I want to show you, and I'm already over time, is the latest thing we're working on at our lab is face dubber. Here we're doing the full line of things. We take, put speech recognition, translation, speech synthesis. Then we do the voice, the speech. If I translate that, the speech then doesn't sound like me anymore. It gets uh, like a synthetic voice. Then I take that voice, convert it back into my voice, and then I modify by neural networks the, um, the video of my face in such a way that it comes out as a video of me speaking in another language. I want to quickly show you that. So this was German, of course. This is dubbed into English. It was fully automatically done. So now you're saying, well, this is a trick. We're playing at our lab, but we can do that with President Farnham at CMU. What? We can do that with President Hanselka.
So President Hanselka does not speak Japanese. We know that. And so you can see that we can actually do that and I have more examples. All right, to wrap up, you can see we can do a lot of things with different modalities by combining them into one. A joint classification, as you saw, saw, fusion of different levels of abstractions. Uh, that's the early and late fusion multimodal to fleximodal to really switch gears when the uh, modality isn't clear, cross-modal repair, repairing one signal by using another, uh, identifying the purpose of a signal, why am I doing it and for whom am I doing it, and we need different sensors and devices that we can combine into one, and that of course happens at the input and at the output, because depending on whether you want to uh, deliver it or not. Sorry to be late, uh, but that's it for today. Thanks. Well, it's a feel I'm in the... <laughs> ich, um...